Well, welcome to the 11.30 a.m. Wednesday Lunch and Bible Study from Doctrine and Studies Bible Church in Birmingham, Alabama. We welcome you as uh, those who are visiting with us by the Internet. We called it a luncheon because we used to actually serve it here at the church, but because of the virus, we've not been able to do that. But instead, we're meeting uh, by video uh, to those who are having lunch in their homes and uh, giving me the opportunity to speak for an hour where they eat their lunch. Last week, we're in a series now called Grieving the Holy Spirit. Last week, we studied grieving the Holy Spirit by giving the devil an opportunity uh, to disrupt the believer's walk by faith. We studied that in Ephesians 4, 26, 27. And one of the things we learned is that the devil is making a big push against the Church of Jesus Christ in America today. And he thinks, this is my opinion, but he thinks he has the Christian church on the ropes in 2020 and is going for the knockout punch just like he did with Adam and Eve in the garden. You can read about that in Genesis 2.17 and then go to the third chapter, verses 1 through 7. You can see the results of this knockout punch in Romans, the fifth chapter, 12 through 21. If you're interested, look at the picture. That's where I'm basing a lot of my ideas from. In today's lesson on grieving the Holy Spirit, Paul introduced in Ephesians 4.28, introduced another way a believer can grieve the indwelling Holy Spirit. Uh, and the title of the lesson is Stealing What Belongs to Others. Stealing What Belongs to Others. I thought it was interesting because there was a saying when I grew up and as a young adult, uh, people would talk about stealing a kiss. And when I was doing my study today, I thought about that and I thought, uh, stealing what belongs to somebody else, uh, stealing a kiss is the idea without their consent, I suppose. Uh, but it did cross my mind about that idea that I hear people, I don't know that people talk that way anymore, but it, that was a, a common saying when I was a young man uh, dating and married. I'm going to talk about four ideas about stealing, which belongs to others today uh, when we get in our study. I want to I want to take a look at the passage. Uh, I'm going to do it in point one, so you might get your Bibles open to Ephesians 4. 28, after I have a word of prayer, I'm going to come and I'm going to break that passage down into three parts where we can see what the writer is saying and we can see why I chose the subject I chose and my explanation of it to the church age believer. So remember, the Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. You can't learn it, nor can you live it in carnality. Evidence of carnality is personal sin. Uh, that could be mental attitude type sins, sins of the tongue, overt sins. How do I move from carnality of the flesh back to the ministry of the Holy Spirit called spirituality in my life? How do I get from carnality back to spirituality? Confession of sin. I tell you often that there's a key word in 1 John 1, 9 I really like. It might surprise you it's not the word confess, although I think it's a wonderful concept. It's the word cleanse. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And that takes us to the cross of Jesus Christ, the word cleansing, and the work of the blood of Christ on the cross that not only cleanses us from our position in Adam, 1 Corinthians 5.22, dead from Christ, and the blood of Christ works when, when we believe the gospel that he died for our sins, was buried and raised on the third day. When we believe that, the blood of Christ cleanses us from Adamic sin. The 13 judicial charges of Adam's sin that you can find in that little pamphlet if you go to our website, 50 things that are free. And by that, we mean grace. So when we come, But when it comes to a believer, the work of Christ on the cross extended to the believer's life, when he confesses his sin, not when he confesses he's a sinner, but when he confesses his personal sin, 
is removed from carnality to spirituality by the grace of God. By the grace of God. Always by the grace of God. So it's a wonderful principle, and I give you a moment now, and I'll have a word of prayer, and we'll get into our morning study, our Wednesday study. Well, Heavenly Father, we thank you that as a believer in the church age, I can confess my sins because of the work of Christ on the cross extends to the Christian life for confession to restore spirituality in my life from sin that's been produced through the sin nature like in James 1, 14 and 15. I pray today, fathers, we look uh, stealing what belongs to someone else. How does a believer deal with that? And how can you steal? And it may not seem like obviously stealing. A lot of people, I think, might actually steal and not realize they're stealing. And it's interesting, for example, the phrase I used in introducing my subject today, stealing a kiss. I mean, the idea is without permission. And so, Father, I pray today as we look at the subject matter, you show us how this works in the church age, how we recover from it. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we're here under point one. We want to, in point one, I want to examine Ephesians 4.28, which my lesson comes from today. I want to divide it in three sections of study. There's A, B, and C. I did it on your paper. If you don't have a copy, you can go to our website. You can pull it down and print it out. But if you don't have it, well, a piece of, a piece of paper will do it as you look at Ephesians 4.28. I, I put it in three sections homiletically. I call the spirit grieved, the supply grace, and the surplus grace. Now, here is the spirit is grieved. That's verse 30, how to grieve the Holy Spirit. I've been talking about it out of the passage. He who steals, there's a definite article with a participle. That's an articulate participle. The one who steals, present active participle, nominative singular masculine in the Greek language. He who steals, klepto. This is where you get the English word kleptomania. Kleptomania is a neuronic impulse for stealing. It's a psychological thing, and there's a whole thing that deals with that. This is actually stealing. It's not a neurotic idea of an impulse. This is actually stealing. However, it could be applied to that later. But this applies to everyone. If you say, well, I'm not a kleptomaniac, I know. But you could be stealing. So I don't... I just say to you, the English word kleptomania comes from the Greek word klepto. That's all I'm saying. He who steals, you know what stealing actually shows you, and I, I know people miss this concept about free enterprise in America, which is a wonderful concept of employment. When it says you steal something that belongs to somebody else, now listen to me. It shows that the writer believed in private ownership. See, this communistic socialist idea that everything is in the common pot and everybody has a common pot. We all have the same equal share of a private pot. The Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible doesn't believe it. In fact, this idea that you can steal something. See, if you can't steal what is common. But it doesn't belong to any one person. It belongs to the community. And the fact that you can steal something that belongs to somebody else shows private ownership. And that's a, that, that is a free enterprise system of employment idea. And it not only, listen, I'm in the New Testament. It was taught in the Old Testament. I'll show it to you today. See, sometimes you have to think for yourself. What does it mean to steal something that belongs to somebody else? It shows private ownership. Oh, I hope you could get that today. My goodness, if you don't get anything else, get that. He who steals must steal no more. 
Makete. Makete. It's a very strong way of emphasizing this. No longer. No longer. The second word still, must still, must still, no longer, is a, watch this now, it's a present active imperative. That's a command. Third person singular, speaking to each individual believer. In context, in Ephesians, Ephesus, Ephesus, Ephesus. He who steals must steal no longer. Very strong way of saying, stop that. You must never take steal. You must never steal what belongs to somebody else. It's the concept. It's a biblical principle of private ownership. Somebody has worked hard to get that. You shouldn't steal it. So stop that. By that word idea stop, he put the participle into the command. The one who is stealing must stop doing that now. It's strong. It's a very, it's a lot stronger than I'm giving it to you. A lot stronger. This, why? It grieves the Holy Spirit. It grieves a whole lot of people if you steal their, their things, but it grieves the Holy Spirit that you would steal something that belongs to somebody else who's worked hard to get it and think it's okay. Now he comes to the supply side of grace, but rather... Here is, here is an alternative idea to the guy who steals, the woman who steals, the young person who steals. But rather, he must labor. He must work. If you want it, go, go earn it and get it. When I was a little boy, I wanted a Red Ryder BB gun. My family said, well, you got to work for it. I, I was really young. So I figured out a way to work and earn it. I wanted a BB gun. I had to earn it. Said, so what could I do? I found out what a eight or nine-year-old could do. I pull milkweeds all summer out of pastures for people because it affects the milk of the... We were in a milking community, farmers. My grandfather taught me to wor raise worms because our farm was on a road that went into a, a, a resort area. And I... I, I cultivated worms, and I grew great, great size worms. And I sold them on the side of the road to people going fishing. And I made a lot of money doing that. And between those two projects, I was able to buy me, on my own, a Red Ryder BB gun. Because I was lived in a community where you had to work. You had to earn what you got. Nobody gave it to you. And whatever they had, they earned to get it. What's happened to us as a culture of people? And so, but rather he must labor. That's a present active imperative. Third person singular. Instead of stealing, he must work for what he wants. Present active imperative, and it's based on employment. He must work. He must be employed. 
That's free enterprise. That's the divine institution. Employment is a divine institution. There are five divine institutions in the book of Genesis. Right out the bat, by the time you get to the 10th and 11th chapter, you have five, di five divine institutions well established in the world. Employment is one of them. My, my, wouldn't it be good to go back and read the Bible? But rather, he must labor, find work, employment, either self-employed. I mean, at the age of, I don't know how old I was, I guess eight, something like that. My grandfather taught me free enterprise. I had to come up with a whole, a whole business system. I had to come up with how much to charge farmers to pull milkweeds uh, by, a, by the sack. I had to farm worms and figure out how I could, what it was cost to me. And I, I was, I was, at eight, I was in a free enterprise system mentality. And my life just began to be a free enterprise guy. I did it all the way through high school. Free enterprise ideas. My grandfather gave me an acre of land, says, go for it, big guy. He did it when I was I like the eighth or ninth grade, something like that. I made more money off that one acre than I could have ever made going and work, work off for somebody else through free enterprise. What has happened to us that we don't understand this is how this is how this thing works. I, I would guess I was just fortunate I grew up in a, a working family that understood this whole system. I was a fortunate kid. The supply side, you, the supply side grace, you must labor, employment, performing with your own hands what is good. Agathos, what is divine good? Agathos. This is the supply side of logistical grace. The supply side of logistical grace. It's Philippians 4.19. God will give you a job. This is He set the system up. Employment, free enterprise. The guy who comes up with an idea, puts his money in it, creates a business, employs people. This is the story of America. They call it capitalism. But this is the story of America. We refer to it as the free enterprise system of employment. There's the boss and the and the laborer. It's all over the Bible, all over the New Testament. It's all over the book of Ephesians. If you'd read it, take time to read. But rather must labor, performing with his own hands, what is the good? It's good to earn your way and see God work in your life and do marvelous things. It's a pretty neat idea. Then the third part, I'm still in verse 28. The third part is this surplus grace. Listen to what he says. So that divine purpose, that's Hina, so that he, the employed, will have something surplus to share supply with one who has Need. That's necessities of life need. My grandfather, when I began to make some money, my grandfather taught me there, there are certain things you do with money. Well, I said, well, I'm buying me a Red Ryder gun, baby gun. He said, well, that's only one thing you do with your money. He said, a rich man is one his money works for him while he sleeps. And boy, I thought a lot about that at the very early age of my life. How can, I, how, can, how can that happen? Well, being a farm guy, I knew it. You go out, you plant, you wait, you wait, you wait, and the rains come, you wait, and there's the harvest. And you got to be wise with the grain you get because some of it feeds 
Some of it is for next year's sowing. So I was taught, no matter how much money you have, you got to do certain things with it. One, you got to earn it, all right? You got to earn it. You got to save some. You got to spend some. Listen to me. And my grandfather says, and you've got to be charitable with some. And my grandfather didn't care if you had a dollar or a hundred dollars or a million dollars. You always did that. You earned it honestly. You spent some of it. You saved some of it. And you was charitable with some of it. Then he would come back and say, that part you're saving, part of that you save where you can get to it, and the other part you invest in something you know works. And when I was a sophomore, I raised rabbits and did a franchise idea with baby rabbits, male and female, selling them to my friends, telling them how much money there was, I sold rabbits. Listen, I sold them to tourists that they weren't familiar with eating rabbit. My, my mother, who was a great cook, showed, had, gave me several recipes in a little book to show them three or four recipes on how to cook rabbit. I harvest rabbit, and I sold rabbit. I sold rabbit as an eating food. Can you believe that? And I sold them to my friends as a way to do business. I franchised. I just a fortunate kid, wasn't I? I was raised in an unbelievable family that believed you should work and earn your money, and your money should work for you. My grandfather said, you'll always be poor unless money works for you while you sleep. You'll always be rich if your money works while you sleep. I believe that. As far as the free enterprise system, I believe that. And I believe God set that whole system up. He talks about it right here. He talks about the supply grace, and he talks about the surplus grace. That you, through, by working, spend, spend some of yourself. Be charitable with some. Be charitable. As a young kid, I looked around. I knew a lot of kids, a lot of families. I knew the Yost family. There were five kids in the family, and the dad was a hard-working guy on the oil fields. And they would run out of money by the end of the month. He got paid once a month, and they always ran out. But you know what the mother did? When she got paid, she went, when you opened the, the, uh, the, the closet in their kitchen, there was a little closet where people would put linen, not her. She put cereal when she had money, she loaded that place up in cereal, and they lived off from cereal the last 10 or 12 days of their existence. They, those kids ate cereal every meal, and they were, they were content. I went home and told my mother, I said, listen, this family across the street, the last, last week or so of their life, they eat cereal every day of their meal. Why, that, that broke my mother's heart to think that they... And so my mother would start knowing that every other day or so, we'd, act, we'd cook a little extra stuff, and I'd carry it over to them. She'd make stew and soup and things like that, and I'd carry over a big old thing. And I don't know, people. Supply. I mean, are, are you, you're making all this money. Do you, do you, what are you doing with it? You put, building barns, or are you helping people out that are in really dire need? Dire need. That this word for need means necessities of life. Necessities of life. So uh, that, there's my text. All right, now I'm going to deal with one part of this today, and that's stealing what belongs to others. Point number two. In Ephesians 4.28, Paul points out two things that grieve the indwelling Holy Spirit. One is stealing what belongs to someone else, and the other one, the other command in that text is neglecting to share surplus goodness of God with others in need of grace. 
Think about that. Who are, who are in the necessities of life. And do you know what? The greatest necessity in the person that has a necessity of life, you know the greatest need in his life? Salvation. Because no matter how many times he eats, and sometimes he quits, he's going to die. The greatest need, the greatest necessity that he had in his life is salvation after death. D the salvation in it and the life eternal that goes with it. So that when he dies from whatever cause, he goes to heaven. If I go feed him and meet one necessity and don't meet the second necessity, what have I benefited him? But in caring about the necessities of life, it puts you with a lot of people who are not saved, who have the greatest necessity of life is to be saved. So when I share with somebody, I want to share, I want to share the gospel of Jesus Christ as well as meet their necessity of life. I'll give you a pair of shoes. I will give you in the winter. I will put a coat on your back. But I'm going to tell you, you need Christ in your life. You need to know that Jesus Christ died for your sins. He was buried and he was raised on the third day to give you life everlasting. And he's going to prepare a place for you so when you die, you'll have a place in hotel heaven. A pair of shoes ain't going to do it but it may give me the opportunity to bring them to Christ. I'm just saying, I'm an ambassador for Christ. I need to be charitable. I'm told that surplus of what I earn, surplus should go into a missionary fund that I'm in charge of over helping necessities of life. That's what Paul is saying and so he points out two things that grieves the indwelling, stealing what belongs to others and not supplying, neglecting, supplying the surpluses of your grace because you haven't prepared for it, ministering to the necessities of life that others are in. It is often the needs of others that bring us into contact with people whose greatest need in their life is grace salvation, not just the necessities of a new pair of shoes or a new coat. This was shown very clearly by Peter and John's ministry to a man crippled from birth who was begging alms at the gate called Beautiful of the temple in Acts, the third chapter, verse 1 through the fourth chapter, verse 4. I know that's a lot of reading for some of you. <gasps> My goodness. But there's a wonderful story there. If you'll take the time to pull yourself away from goofy television that brings you bad news and read the Bible that brings you good news. Well, here's one of the stories that will cheer you up. Listen to what Peter told the man when the man begged for alms of the necessities of life. Peter said, I do not possess silver and gold, but what I have I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Walk. You know what walk meant? Get on your feet and make your own living. But you know, the greatest thing that was done that day was an introduction to the crippled man from birth to the person of Jesus Christ and his work. Walk. <laughs> Walk. What a wonderful gift that day was. Silver and gold have I not. But what I have I will give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. You know what that was? Listen to me carefully. 
that was messianic healing. That wasn't just healing. That was messianic healing. You see, what he just did was Isaiah 61, 1 and 2, which Jesus talked about in Luke 4, 16 through 21. I know. <laughs> oh, dear hearts, you have to study the Bible. Why do you think God brought you in contact with this church ministry? Why do you think they brought you into my life? Why are we connected? Listen to me. The B-I-B-L-E is the book for you and me. Man, I, I'm going to document everything I'll tell you. If you're not too lazy to study it, it will, it will, it will transform your life. Well, he healed that man. He healed him. He gave them a messianic healing, which means Jesus didn't come into the world to heal. Jesus didn't come into the world to heal. Jesus did not come into the world to heal. He came into the world, 1 Timothy 1.15, to save sinners. Romans 5 eight, God demonstrated his love towards us, and then while we were sinners, Christ died for us. That's why Jesus came into the world. That's why I'm in the world. I don't mind giving a person a coat that needs a coat, a meal that needs a meal, but not without Christ. In the name of Jesus, who died on that cross for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead on the third day. That's the greatest message. The greatest gift I can give him is the one God gave me, grace, salvation. Well, to heal that old boy, messianic healing, which means the, the focus is on Jesus coming to die on a cross, being buried and raised from the dead to give you life everlasting. It's not about healing. It's not about healing. Get off that wagon. Jesus had come in the world to heal. He healed in order to identify that he'd come to save the sinner from his sin. Oh, my, 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 my. Well, what did that do? It attracted a large crowd. When you read the third chapter, 1 through 10, when he got up walking and dancing and hollering and scooting and running and jumping and leaping, it drew a crowd. Hey, ain't that, old, ain't that old Joe crippled from birth? Looks like him. Now I can't be. Well, let's get, to get a better look. My goodness, Joe, what happened to you? I don't know. Two guys told me that Jesus Christ of Nazareth would heal me, and he did. Well, they, that crowd wanted to hear more. So they gathered around Peter and John, and Peter preached a great gospel sermon to them. In the third chapter, verse 11, through the fourth chapter, verse 4. And listen, why Jesus healed the man and let him walk? Because that day, 5,000, the Bible says, about 5,000 believed. <laughs> well, I just was going to the grocery store the other day, you might say. There was somebody out there wanting me to buy a loaf of bread and give it to them. Right? What you going to do about that? You going to give them a couple of dollars to get out of your way? You going to go in and get a loaf of bread and throw it over to them and say, get out of my way? Are you going to say to him, listen, God loves you. Your greatest need in life, I'm going to tell about. I'm going to go in and get you a loaf of bread and some bologna. I'm going to bring that out here to you. But I want you to think about what I got to say. And when I come back out with your loaf of bread and bologna, I want to talk to you about it. See if he's there when you come out. You give him the gospel. Let him meditate on it. And then go for a decision from him. 
Oh, yeah, it took a little more of your time. It took you a little out of your way. You felt a little uncomfortable. It's time to get out of that. My, my, my. Church of Jesus Christ is asleep at the wheel, and the world's dying underneath it. Point number three. The eighth of the, the, eighth of the Ten Commandments, Mosaic Law, of Exodus 20 says, you shall not steal. You can read Exodus. I know. Oh, my goodness. I'm going to ask you to read 17 verses. <laughs> I know. When you read them, you're going to see that the Ten Commandments is interesting. It has a God side. Four, the first four are on the God side. And the last sex is on the man's side. When you, look at the la when you look at the last six, you're going to find one positive and five negatives. So you don't pay any attention when you read. You just read. I don't know why you read the Bible. Just check it off. Well, I read through the Bible. I've read through the Bible every year of my life. Yes, but how much of it is stuck between your two ears? I care how many times you read the Bible. It's how much of the Bible stays with you. You walk by faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. And that, that, that Bible is, is God breathed, inhaled, and exhaled in 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17. That's when the Bible becomes an important book. My, my, my. I said that the last six commands on the man's side, the community side of life, not the God side of life, but the community side of life, One's positive and five are negative. Thou shall not, King James. Well, now you're, I hope you're interested. Go back and read it. Wouldn't that be good? Listen, in my elementary school at Pine Grove, Oceana County, Michigan, one a one-room schoolhouse with one teacher in eight grades. It was the best education I could have ever gotten. It gave me such a strong foundation of the basics that I could go to college. I know. <laughs> Pine Grove, Oceana County, Michigan. Little country rural school, Pine Grove. On the wall, as you walk through, walk through the where we hung our coats and everything, the foyer, and walked into the classroom, there on the wall was rules of conduct. We had to learn those six rules of conduct. One of those, thou shalt not steal. <laughs> I had no idea they were part of the Ten Commandments. I didn't even know they came from the Bible. It didn't say that. These were the rules we lived by in that school. It was the rules by our whole community lived. It was community life. We all lived by those rules. I had no idea. I was a grown man when I realized reading the Ten Commandments. I went, holy mackerel, they were on thy wall of that school in Pine Grove. And let me tell you, we lived by them. I had no idea. They were in the Bible or they were from God. They were community rules and they were good rules and the whole community lived by them. We didn't steal among many other things. <laughs> Fine girl. I mean, I, when I read this stuff like this, I, I go right back to my elementary school in Pine Grove. Phil is bringing teaching. Walking through that door. And he got in trouble. Hey, you went to the rules. 
He went to the rule book. You know why you don't do that? And there was always a common sense answer to it. Well, Ronnie, well, how would you like somebody coming? Steal your lunch or steal your bike or steal your pencil or whatever, whatever. Oh, there it is, Ronnie. <laughs> Nobody ever told me. But I knew those rules, buddy, and we lived by them. We lived by them. So let me tell you what the purpose of the Mosaic Law is in the Bible. Why did God give us ten rules we could never keep? Because if you violate, James 2.10 says, if you violated one, you were guilty of all of them. Now imagine that. If you break one, you've broke them all. What was God trying to prove with me? That you're a sinner in need of salvation. Oh, oh you say, where do you find that in the Bible? Well, you ought to read James 2.10 and Galatians 5.3. Then you ought to read Galatians 3.24, which I wrote on your paper. Listen to this, Paul. Therefore, the law, capital L, Mosaic, has become our tutor to lead us to Christ so that we may be justified by faith. For by grace are ye saved through faith and not of yourself. It is a gift of God. Did you know why that is true? Do you know why we have the Mosaic Law? It is our tutor to lead us to Christ because nobody can keep the Ten Commandments. Nobody can keep the law out of the Ten Commandments comes a greater uh, a bounty of laws in the book of Leviticus and Deuteronomy. This is the Bill of Rights and the rest that comes off from it. It all pointed that we were in need of a Savior. Don't steal. What was that the point? You need, you need to be saved. <laughs> oh, I tell you, if you'd read the Bible, it would clear up so many problems in your life, it would be unbelievable. How about Romans 10.4? Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. End of the law. Christ is the end of the law. How about Matthew 5.17 and Luke 24.44? I know, that's a whole lot of reading, isn't it? <laughs> oh, my, my. The church-age believer operates, listen to me, I'm a church-age believer, so are you if you're a believer. The church-age believer operates under a higher law than the Mosaic law. I don't live under the Mosaic law. I live under a higher law that, that is greater than the Mosaic law. When you live on the higher law, you are fulfilling the Mosaic law. What is that higher law, you ask? It's found in Romans, the eighth chapter, one through four. Oh, now you want to write it down. That's good. I'm happy for that. Romans eight, one through four. Listen to what verse two says. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. <laughs> you ought to read Galatians 5, 1 and 13, not on your paper. Should be. You should write it. I know. Galatians 5, 1 and 13. It was for freedom that Christ set you free. My, my. Here's Romans 8, chapter verse 4 so that the requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Holy Spirit. It's the higher law, the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. You did know that, didn't you? Do now. What do you mean you don't know it? <laughs> I just taught it to you. The church-age believer approaches the subject of stealing differently than if he was under the law. The church-age believer approaches it by the love of God. Talked about by Paul in Galatians 5, 22 and 23, the fruit of the Spirit is love. 
Listen to Romans, the eighth, listen to Romans. In the greater passage, it's going to be Romans 13, 8 through 10. I want to read just a portion. Owe nothing to anyone except to love one another. For he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. For this, you shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not covet. See, all that's right out of the man side of the Ten Commandments. And if there is any other commandment, it will be summed up in this saying, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I want to go back to that passage because I guarantee you, you've missed it. You know, when you don't read the Bible, you don't listen to the people who tell it to you. I don't know why you go to church. I don't know why you listen to me. I'm going to go back. Here's what he said. Love fulfills the law. And he lists. Listen to what he lists on that. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not covenant. Remember I said on the sixth commandment side, one positive, five negatives. How many negatives did, did the writer give you? So you don't pay any attention. He gave you four. How many, how many do you actually have? You have five. He gave you four. One missing. Do you think that the writer knew there were five negatives? Do you think Paul knew there were five negatives and one positive? Oh, you betcha he knew. And do you know that he left one out? Do you think he left one out on purpose? You betcha. What was the one he left out? Well, you'd have to go all the way back to Exodus 20, believe it or not, and read to find it. You will find it in verse 16. And it's called bearing false testimony. Now, let me tell you, Paul is a master debater. So when Paul says, you shall not commit adultery. There's those holy roller guys that'll go, I'm okay there. You will not murder. I'm good. You shall not steal. I'm good. You shall not covet. Mm, I'm pretty good. Wow, I am in good shape. Yeah. How about this one? Bearing false witness. See, Paul left that out to make a point to the people he was teaching. See, if I was in a prison system of criminals, I might leave stealing out or I might leave murder out because adultery, I mean, they would, you know what I mean? Did Paul know he left one out? Of course he did. Because you've missed the point. So I'm going to go back and give it to you. If there is any other commandment, it is summed up in this saving. Watch this now. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. 
And he had people in that congregation that he is going to call their attention to of bearing false witness against one another. We used to call it tatty talent. Tatty, tattle, 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 pants on fire, you know. As kid stuff. You should read Romans, the 13th chapter, verses 8 through 10. You should read Matthew 22, 37 through 40. And you should read Galatians 5, 14. We do not live under the law. We live under the higher law of the Holy Spirit, life in Christ. The greatest commandment of all is to love others, love your neighbor as yourself with the love of God in the power of the Holy Spirit. You fulfill the law. Jesus said the whole law is fulfilled in these two ideas. Love God and love your neighbor. We got so much tongue waggling in the churches today. I listen to this COVID-19 business and how people are turning other people in for not wearing a mask or not distancing or not doing whatever the government says. Next, it'll be dress up in a trench coat and wear straw in your hair. And it'll keep the virus away. My, my, my. God is the only thing to keep the virus away. Why do you think we have it? My, my, good grief. The church is sound asleep at the wheel, and the church and the world is, is dying underneath it, and they don't care. They're so caught up in foolishness. Let me tell you about stealing, point number four. Let's take a look at some of the ways... One might steal what belongs to another and might not consider it stealing, like steal a kiss. How about items like paper and pens that don't belong to you? They belong to your company. Well, you say they have plenty of them. That's not the point. You steal when you take something that belongs to somebody else. What's wrong with you? Or how about tools from a company who has tools? You steal them and say, well, you lost them or they got stole by somebody else and actually they're in your, they're in your closet, they're in your basement, they're on your wall. Well, they can afford it. That's not the point. Gee whiz, what's wrong with you? Here's another way you steal and you might not think. It's time on work. I get paid for eight hours. I goof off six of them, or I goof off Two of the eight, they should dock you because you've stole from them. You've stole time. You said you would work eight. And they would give you time 30 minutes for lunch. You should be honorable. Otherwise, you're stealing. I know. And for a boss... How about wages? You come up with this goofy idea. When a guy really becomes productive for you, you put him on a salary. He used to work 40 hours for a certain amount of money. You give him a little, a little raise. You give him a little piddle and raise, and put him in a position of management, and you work him 70 And you pay him for 50. That's theft. 
and we have a lot of it going on in the business world. It's greed, it's corrupt, and it's wrong. It's stealing. I'll tell you another one. Changing job descriptions without consultation with a person. Boy, you better have a job description. Otherwise, you have no idea what you're doing and pay, being paid for. You need to know what you have, what's required of you for the money you're making and the hours you're putting in. And when they don't give you a job description, they're full of greed. And they're stealing from you. And they don't care. And you got to hold them accountable. Hold them accountable when you go to work with them. And don't let them change your job description. They say, well, I can get somebody else to do your job. Well, you can have it because you're a thief. Do you know that? How about taking from the pension fund or the retirement and using it for something else, thinking you've got 20 years to replace it? That's theft. Not living up to contractual agreements. Stealing. The list goes on and on and on. And people say to me, Ron, that's just the way you do business. You don't do business as a believer. Stealing. We're under a higher law. You should love your neighbor as yourself. You wonder why we're in trouble in America? This is the problem we're in. Stealing is taking something that does not belong to you, but does belong to someone else. My grandfather, when I was a little boy, we would every Saturday go to town with some grain to have milled for feed to take back for the cows. And while we would drop it off, then we would, my grandfather was one who liked to chat and talk to people, country people. We would go to New Era, a little town, go to the mill, and then my grandfather would go around. We would usually go down to the post, po, Postumas. One day we stopped off at the Postumas, the store, I got out of the truck, and I looked down, and there was the dollar bill. Now, a dollar bill back on Monday bought a whole lot of stuff. A dollar bill was a big deal. That would be like a $10 or $20 bill probably today, something like that. It's a lot of money to me. That's a whole lot of, that's a lot of worms. <laughs> I jumped like, I said, Grandfather, I found a dollar. My grandfather said, Well, Ronnie, is it yours? Did you drop it? I said, No, sir. He said, Well, it belongs to somebody. Would you agree with that, Ronnie? It belongs to somebody. I said, Yes, sir. He said, Well, let's take it in and talk to Mr. Postema. So we did. Went in and my grandfather, Guy Holman, said to me, Ronnie, d d show him the money. So I said to Mr. Postman, Mr. Postman, I found a dollar out in your parking lot at, as a, right at the entrance where we parked to come into the store. And he said, well, I don't know who it is. I don't know who it is, Ronnie. I have no idea what, whose it is. I, I guess you can just keep it. My grandfather said, no, he can't. I looked at my grandfather like, hey, we're supposed to be on the same team. He said, no, we can't, because that doesn't belong to us, and it actually don't belong to you. Mr. Postman said, well, you're right, Guy. You're absolutely right. What do, you, what do you think we should do? I am the blessed of God to have a grandfather like I have. He said, get an envelope. Let's put the date on it. Put Ronnie's name on the envelope. And this dollar. He 
if nobody claims it, over this week, when we come back next week, we'll stop in. If nobody's claimed it, it'll be Ronnie's. Is that agreeable with you, Mr. Postema? He said, yes, guy. I That would be good. We went out and got in the truck, and I said to my grandfather, hey, what? <laughs> he was going to give that to me. And he said, yeah, but it wasn't yours to give away. And it wasn't his, Ronnie. It wasn't. It wasn't yours, and it wasn't his to do that. Suppose that dollar was really important to somebody that, you know, he had nine, and he needed 10. And he had his 10, and somehow he couldn't get what he wanted because he only had nine, and he lost that dollar. And so he's going to backtrack, and he's going to, he's going to come, and he said, the last place I remember was at Postuma's. He's going to go in and say, Mr. Postuma, did anybody turn in a dollar? And he's going to say, yes, he did. Well, who would that be? He said, well, a little boy called Ronnie Adama was with his grandfather, found it, and they wanted to leave it in case it was necessary. He said, that man would be so happy. My grandfather told that little story. I went like, oh, wow. I know you want to know if we went back next week and I got that dollar. We went back next year, next week, and I got that dollar. But the lesson I got from that was life-changing as a little kid. I have never forgot it. It changed my life and the way I thought about things that don't belong to me and other people. And my grandfather created a story that really made sense to me. Two weeks ago, with this COVID thing, I went to a drive through restaurant to pick up some lunch for Jane and I. I gave the guy a $20 bill, and I, I, th I think it was something like 6 or $8, the meal. And there was a whole line. Oh, my goodness. There was just cars everywhere. And... I got the food, and, you know, people, I could tell people want, oh, come on, push it, go on. And so I, I put my money rather than look at it. It looked pretty good. You know, I get 20, and I, got, I saw bills and some change. I put it down in the tray where I keep uh, in, the, in the car uh, where I keep change, a change tray. And I, I got to thinking as I was driving away, before I came out of the parking lot, I went, you know, I'm not comfortable. I think I got too much money here. So I, I pulled into a parking place. I counted the money I just put in there, the bills. Listen to me. I had 40 extra dollars. I had 40. Don't I? I had 40 extra dollars. I had 40 extra dollars. I might have, I might have let my thoughts go. Well, your loss is my gain. Your mistake is your loss, and it's my gain. But you see, my grandfather, still speaking in my heart, would say, Does that belong to you, Ronnie? No, sir, that belongs to somebody. So what you going to do, Ronnie? I said, well, I, I'm going to go back and clear this up, granddaddy. You sure are, son. I said, well, I'll do it tomorrow. Mm -mm. No, somebody may need it today, Ronnie. Listen, that's my grandfather. And wasn't the Holy Spirit of God? It may have been, but I'm just telling you what went through my soul. I could hear my grandfather go through this whole deal with me as a little kid. No, mm -mm, somebody may need it today, Ronnie. It was lost today. It was for, for today. So what you going to do? I said, well, I know exactly what I'm going to do. So I dropped, now I got my food. My wife is waiting at home. I pull in. I'm way at the back of the line now. When I get to the, when I get to the, 
little box where you do your orders. I say, I have money to return. There was this long pause. <laughs> there was this long pause. And she said, excuse me, sir? I said, I have money. I just got my order, but I have money to return. Be sure your manager's at the window when I get there. My name is Ron, R-O-N. There was another pause, and she said, okay. And so here I am. I'm back in the line, going through the whole thing. I get to the window. I said, here, I just was through here, and I went through the story. I have my receipt, get an envelope. <laughs> Manager says, no, that's fine. I can handle it. I said, no, ma'am, you can't. Because you see, this $40 is not mine. It's not yours. So get me an envelope if, if this $40 is going to be exchanged because I got it from in there, but I don't know where I got it, and I'm going to tell you, I want an envelope. What are you going to do with the envelope? You and I, you're going to sign my receipt. We're going to put it in the envelope. We're going to seal it, and tomorrow, I'm going to be back to find out what happened to that $40, because it's not mine. It's not yours. You didn't drop it. Did you drop it out? No, sir, I didn't. I didn't either. I've got $40. It didn't come from me, and it didn't come from you. But it comes from somebody, and tomorrow morning I'll be back, and you can explain that to me. And if it can't be explained, that's my $40 because it's not yours, and it's not mine. But I found it, and I want to be honorable on my end of it, and I'm going to hold you accountable on your end of it. And she said, well, I'd be glad to do it, but I'm sure it's ours, and I'm sure it will come. I said, well, I don't know about sure, sure. <laughs> I'll just know. I wound up with $40 that's not mine, and I know it's not yours. She said, well, I'm, I'm the manager. I said, look, unless you own it, I still want that. I don't care if you own it. I want that envelope, and we're going to go through this routine. It's, it's just good for both of us. You know what did that? I was taught as a little boy not to steal what belongs to others. What, what, what makes you think that you have some kind of an insight that allows you to steal what belongs to others and not be held accountable for it? My message to you today, clean up your act. We live under a higher law, spirituality. The spirit of life in Christ Jesus is a much higher law. And when we do it in love and honor, it's a safety net for the rest of the community, our nation, and the world because it reflects the character of God. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we're so thankful. You're always giving us little tests, aren't you? How wonderful they are when we pass them. Do not steal. And if you have, stop stealing what belongs to other people. Even, if, even a kiss without consent. Encourage our hearts, Father, to be men of character of Christ. To love our neighbor as ourself. Who loves God with all the heart, soul, strength, and mind. And it reflects in the way we manage other people and our lives in Jesus' name, amen.